Well, good morning, Trinity. Let's try again. Good morning. Man, it is incredible to be with you. Uh, my, my heart is overwhelmed. I, I know I'm an old timer enough here that, you know, most of you are new uh, since I have been here, but to see what God is doing and to understand what he has done in my life since I, I was here, um, literally going on 18 years ago, uh, it, it really is overwhelming my soul. And I, I am so honored that uh, uh, Pastor Carl and the elders of Trinity uh, allowed me the opportunity to come here today and to share with you guys. Um, I love your pastor. Uh, I had a tremendous opportunity this um, past March. He and I went to Israel together. And we were able to make that journey, and of the small group of us, he and I were the early birds, and so we had a lot of breakfast together, sometimes overlooking the old city of Jerusalem, sometimes overlooking the Sea of Galilee. We got to talk a lot about life and ministry and all the things we do together, and I, you know, I hadn't had the opportunity to get to know him like that until then, and was just overwhelmed with the gift that God has given uh, through he and Gloria here at Trinity Church. And so, guys, it's just a, it is an immense, immense honor to be with you. Um, if you will, find a Bible. Uh, I don't care what version you have, if you are proud of your phone and want to get that out and find Luke chapter 7, if you're old school and want to go paper, it matters not, just find the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Luke. We're going to delve into an encounter um, Jesus had. Um, this past month has actually been uh, my sabbatical month, like Pastor Carl's on right now, and it, it's been a month where I have found myself in moments like this where I have been overwhelmed. It was a couple of weeks ago, I had a rare opportunity. I, I went to church with my folks in, in my hometown. Uh, I don't get to do that very much because of what I, what I do. Uh, and I was sitting in that church and I was remembering. I, I wasn't a church kid growing up. It was when I was in the third or fourth grade, a lady that my mom worked with in, asked my mom if she could take my brother, my sister, and myself to church on Sunday morning uh, in a bus. Now, probably not many of you are old enough to remember when we used to do bus ministry, and it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't a liability or anything like that to do it, but I, I was a bus ministry kid. Um, I remember when my mom came home and told us this Sunday maybe we would want to go on this bus, and she was telling about everything she thought she knew about the bus. And I, I looked back, and she was really quite persuasive. And I've got to thinking, maybe my mom's motives weren't utterly selfless. I'm sure there was a part of us, her that wanted us to have some foundation of faith in our lives. But I also look at back, and I know my brother and I, and we were tough. We were like ADD1 and ADD2 before they had a name for it and had medication. Um, I gave my daddy plenty of opportunities to spare the rod and spoil the child, you know what I'm saying? Um, and so I think my mama was looking Sunday morning and thinking that was three hours that somebody else was taking care of these monsters of a boy and she could have a little break with my dad. So no matter what happened, it was, it, it was there. It was because of an invitation, somebody just like yourself, that I ended up at a church. That's where I met Jesus. And it was because of that invitation that my mom returned to her roots of faith eventually. And my dad gave his life to Jesus some eight years later at that very place. I found myself on Father's Day two weeks ago sitting in that church. My, my expectations were low. A lot had changed. I mean, the church I was part of back then wasn't Trinity Church. Uh, it wasn't the way where I am. I, I didn't expect a lot to happen. I was there with my parents. I mean, if I were really honest with you, I love the people. But if I lived in that town, I would not go to that church. Uh, it would not be where I was. So um, they started the first song. It's a non-instrumental church. They started singing this old hymn, and I, I was just there, and I found myself overwhelmed. I mean, I had big old tears in my eyes. I was looking down the row. First time ever, all my kids and all their spouses were there. And so I have two kids that were born here in Lubbock. We have an adopted child we've had since Abilene. My two olders actually have two godly spouses, and I, I was just overwhelmed. They love Jesus, uh, and I was overwhelmed at all that God had done in my life. I was thinking back to my life and where it started and where it might have ended up and where it was, all because of what started in that place. See, I was overwhelmed, and I want you to hear the word and let it really sink in. I was overwhelmed by this thing called grace. Now, if you've been in church any at all, you, you've heard the word grace. It's a word we're familiar with, but I'm telling you, I believe we misunderstand it, and, and we have a danger, and the danger is the longer we sit in a room like this, the less amazed we become at this thing called grace. A growing amazement with grace is a sign of spiritual vitality, and when we start struggling with our amazement, it tells us we need to look at something at our hearts. 
I, I want to show you what, you mean, what, what I mean by this. I want us to delve into a story in Luke chapter 7 that contrasts two people. Two people that we can choose to be, a person who is amazed or a person who struggles. Luke chapter 7, verse 36 says, one of the Pharisees, say Pharisees. We're going to come back to that. I just want you to grab that. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner. Those two phrases are key. When she learned that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now just for a moment, get a picture of this event. You've got two pastors who are basically at one of their houses, and all of a sudden, this woman arrives and begins washing Jesus' feet with her tears and this ointment. Now, I know that's a, a, a strange thing for us, but in that day, it would have been fairly common when you went into a house that an act of hospitality, maybe like we offer a drink today, an act of hospitality would have been to wash someone's feet. I mean, the world was different then. They didn't have concrete, they didn't have pavement, they didn't have chip seal, they had dirt. And the most common way of getting around was just old school flip flops, baby. And so you can imagine your feet were just caked with dirt by the time you finished the day. And to have somebody wash your feet was refreshing and renewing and was a common practice in that day. This woman begins to do it. Verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, he didn't say out loud, he just thunk it. He said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Second time you said that. That's a euphemism. It's a nice way of saying she was a woman of the night. Member of the oldest profession known to man. She was a prostitute. When a woman married in that day, what she would do is she would move her hair up. If you kept your hairs down, it was advertisement. It was saying, I was, I'm available. I'm available higher. This was the kind of woman that was washing Jesus' feet. Verse 40, Jesus answered what Simon thought. I find that amazing. I don't know if you do. It had to wig Simon out. Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, go ahead, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. The other owed 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. You're right on. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, he confesses, are many. They are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little. Maybe another way of saying that, he who thinks he's forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this that he thinks he even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. When this woman encountered Jesus... This woman that no one wanted to be in the same room with. They weren't inviting her to church on Sunday. They didn't want to share the same air with her. Someone who just considered to be unworthy totally. When this woman encountered Jesus, she encountered grace. I mean, come on, as we read that story, isn't there something inside of you go, that's it. That's what my soul aches for. That's what my soul longs for. That's what my heart desires. I need grace. And the good news of Jesus what is incredible is that grace is available for all. Even more, you got to hear that grace is not just something you receive. Grace is a person you encounter. You encounter him again and again and again. When John told his Christmas story, it was more theological than the facts of the story. And he says in John 1, 14, And the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have beheld his glory, glory as from the only Father. And he was full of grace and he was full of truth. See, are you hearing what the Bible says? Grace is more than a dogma. It's more than a doctrine. It is more than something that just covers our sins. Grace is a person. Grace isn't a name that we give our cute little girls 
when they're being born. It's more than that. Grace isn't what we call British royals when we're watching the shows about the British royals because for some reason Americans are enamored with them and we love to practice our bad British accents while we do it. Grace isn't just a, a prayer you say before a meal. See, grace is a person. Grace has a name, and grace is something you encounter again and again and again in your life, and as you encounter it again and again and again, our amazement is supposed to grow. But the danger, the longer we sit in a room like this, the more we can become like Simon. You see, grace makes this amazing statement. Grace brings forgiveness that you cannot earn and you don't deserve. Grace brings forgiveness that you cannot earn and you do not deserve. Now, I want you to go back in your Bible to verse 36, and I want you to go back to that word we said, Pharisee. See, it's important that we understand a little bit about the Pharisees and the Sadducees because their journey, if we are not careful, can easily become our journey. See, if you go and look in the Bible, you will find that in the Old Testament, the Pharisees and Sadducees are never mentioned. They are not there. But you get to the Gospels, and boom, they're in the center of attention. See, something happened. If you go back in your mind in the Bible just a little bit, I'm going to throw some dates at you. And some of you took history with a coach in high school. We're not going to do that, okay? It can be okay. If you go to Jesus' birth, let's say AD 1, it was around that time, you go back 900 years. Remember, B.C. is backwards. 900 A.C. is somewhere about the time of King David. King David had a son named Solomon. Solomon, under his reign, Israel was its most prosperous. And Solomon had a son by the name of Rehoboam. Under Rehoboam, the nation divides into two nations. You have Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Both nations struggled to follow God. God sent prophets. He sent voices. Sometimes they would have a king that would lead them rightly. Sometimes they wouldn't. But they had this on-again, off-again relationship with God. And they, they struggled. And they struggled to the point that God brought discipline. And then finally God had to bring judgment. It was in 721 B.C. that God sent the Assyrians to bring judgment on Israel. It was in 586 B.C. that he brought judgment to Judah through the Babylonians. He brings judgment not because he wants to be done with anyone. Because he's doing whatever it takes so people will come to him and experience what he has for them. He experiences life. Come on, some of you have experienced that. You've had places in your life where you said, there's no way I would wish what I've gone through on my worst enemy, but I would not change it for anything in the world. Because it was because of that journey that you met Jesus. After 70 years of the second captivity, God graciously brings Israel back to their land. And they recognized that the reason they were taken into judgment because of their disobedience, they would not follow God, and they would not follow his ways. And so they made a covenant with God. And they said, we're going to follow your ways. We're going to follow your ways. Come on. That sounds right and good, doesn't it? It's the same kind of thing we said when we say yes to Jesus. We say we will be his follower. The book of the, oh, the Old Testament ends that way. Last page of the book of Malachi. You go to the first page of the New Testament. The time between those two pages is 400 years. Say 400. Now think about it. Our nation, which we think is ancient in a lot of ways, celebrated its 239th celebration yesterday. 400 years is a long time. Scholars call it the intertestamental period, the time of Silas. All we know is that during that season, two groups of people rose up. They were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were the leaders among the Jews, kind of like Baptist and Church of Christ are among churches today. Same religion, same group, just two different trains of thought that they have. They rose up, and they wanted to make sure that we don't go back to Babylon. We want to make sure we don't go back to Assyria. They wanted to ensure that we kept the law. And so they began a journey, and that journey changed everything. See, in the Scripture, Old Testament, there are 613 laws, 613 things that we're supposed to keep. But to make sure that they did not disobey any of those, the Pharisees and the Sadducees began to build a fence around the law. Let me explain what that means. How many of you are familiar with the thing called the Ten Commandments? Hands up. You kind of get that. Some of you are not going to raise hands for me. We're going to have a long morning. Okay. Um, we have the Ten Commandments. I'm not going to make you quote them, say them. Just know that number four says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Now, the question is, what does that mean? It says not to work on the Sabbath. What does it mean not to work? Well, the Pharisees and the Sadducees started making rules, telling people what it meant to work well, what it meant to work. By the time of Jesus, there were volumes and volumes and volumes of 
thick volumes upon volumes and volumes of rules about the law and what not to keep. Still happens in Israel today. Uh, when I took Pastor Carl to Israel this March, I, I, I do this always. When we have Sabbath, Sabbath begins at sundown on Friday and sundown on Saturday in the Jewish world. Um, they have in the hotels where we stay, they always have a special elevator. And that elevator opens and closes on every floor, and all the lights are lit up. And there's a little sign um, that's beside it. Uh, from school, I read just a hair bit of Hebrew, not a lot. I happen to know it says Shabbat. It means it's a Shabbat elevator. What a Shabbat elevator does is it opens and closes on every floor so you don't have to push the button. Because pushing the button would be lighting a light, which is like lighting a fire. And the law says you do not light a fire on the Sabbath. You do it ahead of time. So to make sure you don't light a light on the Sabbath, the rabbis have now said in modern days that you don't push a button for an elevator because that would be work. Now, we laugh at that, but we get just as silly in our rules. And we tend to do the same thing. And what the Pharisees and Sadducees began to believe is that they were right before God because they were keeping the rules. I used to think the exact same thing. If you had asked me to explain this word grace a while back, here's how I would have explained it. Let's say for a second, this podium, this is heaven. You want to go to heaven? Well, you'll get there eventually. Uh, I think you really do want to go to heaven. That's our destination. We all want to be there. Here is the starting point. What I would have said was the journey of faith is like this, that I am going to obey God, follow God, do all I can as far as I can. I wanted to labor as far as I could. Now, I would have told you as a young man, probably even the early days here at Trinity, that I knew that I couldn't get all the way to heaven. No one could do that. I mean, that's why we need Jesus. But I was going to go as far as I could go. I was going to work as far as I was going to be zealous. And God was going to make up the gap through Jesus. And in my mind, the gap was grace. Hear me, my goal was to need as little grace as possible to get to heaven. It made sense in my world. I, I, I grew up in a day where, you know, I like to tell my kids they have it better than I had it when I was growing up, and they, and they do, and I, I love that. Every parent wants to be able to provide a life that's a little bit better uh, for them than their parents were able to provide for them. My dad did. My dad was the first high school graduate in the family. And so he didn't make a lot of money, but he made more money than my grandpa made. He did as much as he could for us. But in that day, we just had to do a lot more. Mike, I can remember having one car. I mean, that's like a radical thought in modern day America. We had one car until I was in the ninth grade. I remember having to walk and bike and go places. By the time I tell my kids the story, everywhere I walked was uphill. It was amazing that Pampa was so hilly. It was snowed all the time in Pampa. Um, I, I will say I had to work some. I mean, I remember wanting to buy a bike. I was probably 10, 11 years old. And I would mow a few yards around the neighborhood and such. And I was saving my money. The bike was 100 bucks, which was like, <laughs> like a lot of money back then. And I made $75. I'd saved and I'd worked. My dad was proud of me. And my dad said, man, I'm proud of the way you worked, what you did. So he gave me $25. And I thought that was grace. You know, think about that for just a moment. If this is grace, I do 75%. God makes up the 25%. Who's really ultimately responsible for my journey to heaven? Me. I ended up being arrogant. I would look down on people not as zealous at me. I would look down on people in lifestyles like the woman in the text, and I would look down my nose at her, thinking she could do what I was doing. I didn't know her story. I didn't know her story. I lacked compassion. I lacked a heart because I thought somehow I had done this thing. And I found myself, instead of growing in my love and amazement, I found myself growing in arrogance and religion, just like Simon in the text so easy to do. The longer we're in a church like this, the more we can miss the reality and the wonder of this thing called grace. You want to me to tell you what grace really is? This is a very bad definition of grace. It's counter what the Bible teaches. I'll tell you what grace is. This is heaven, right? Everybody wants to go to heaven? Ah, yeah. right, you're getting there now. Good, good. Oh, well, you're going to heaven. This is where we start. Do you know how far I can go to heaven on my own without Jesus? You ready to see how much we can do? Ready? I want you to count to three. I'll show you. Ready? One, Two, three, that's it. What I deserve on my own is hell. The wrath of God to stay as an enemy of God. 
Grace is Jesus paying everything. It is doing the total picture of the reality of God in our lives. It is forgiveness that I cannot earn and I do not deserve. It is why Paul just busted out with praise in the middle of his letter to the church of Ephesus when he says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourself. It is the gift of God. It is not of your works so that you cannot boast. The more we think we've done, the less we think we've been forgiven. The less that we think we've been forgiven, according to our text, the less we love. You want to love God? Ask him the depth of the reality of sin so you can stand at amazement at the grace of God. One way we know we've really encountered grace, that's what we see in the text, is grace changes us and empowers us to live differently. Grace always changes us to empower us to be different and to live differently. Grace will change you. You cannot help but be changed by grace if you encounter grace. See, I know there are people who abuse the concept of grace as an excuse to do whatever they want to do. When I was early in my days in Abilene, not long after leaving here, I had a family bring a young man to me. Um, to my office, and they wanted me to talk to him about life. And normally what happens when somebody's brought to my office is they sit there and stare at me for however long we have. They try to get on their phone, stuff like that. So I just now ask them, do you want to talk to me? If they say no, I let them get on their phone, and I go do something else and send them back to their folks. But this guy wanted to talk to me a little bit, and I said, why did your folks send you this way? He said, well, they don't like the way I'm living. They don't like the choices I'm making. He told me some of the choices he was making. I said, what's your plan for your life? And he had it all written down. He said, I'm going to move to Lubbock. I'm going to go to Texas Tech University. I'm going to party. I'm going to party hard. I'm going to carouse with women. Now, he didn't use the word carouse, but I can't use the word he used um, here. And then someday, when I get done with that, I'm going to find a girl who didn't party, who didn't carouse, and I'm going to marry her, and we're going to settle down and have a great life. I just inside just giggled at that, thinking she won't have you, Tex. Um, but anyway, I remember asking him the question. I said, what do you think God thinks about this? He just had a big old smile on his face. And he said, Pastor David, isn't that what grace is for? I want you to hear me. Anyone who has ever flaunted their sin in the name of grace have not encountered grace. Can I say that again? Anyone who flaunts their sin in the name of grace has not really encountered grace. This woman in the text, she didn't flaunt her sin. Notice what she did. You go back to verse 37. She brought a vial, a jar of, of ointment, of alabaster ointment. This was not a $4 can of Crisco. Scholars tell us that an alabaster jar of ointment was worth a year's salary. What are you making a year? 35,000, 40, 45, the average salary in Abilene, probably similar to Lubbock, 35 to $45,000 a year. Let's take the high end of that, 45 grand, because we're people of favor. We want to be in the high end of the average. $45,000 bottle of perfume. And she breaks it at the feet of Jesus. Why? Why would she have such an expensive bottle? It's part of her trade. Read the book of Proverbs, and when it talks about the adulterous woman, and the prostitute of a woman. It talks about the way she smells. This woman had to smell the part. She was advertising the wares. And what she did is she took that which represented her. It represented her failures, her past, her identity. She broke this bottle of alabaster all over Jesus' feet. She took the hair, which also advertised who she was, and she put it at Jesus' feet. And she asked Jesus to totally forgive her. She encountered Jesus. And when she encountered Jesus and she encountered his grace, she didn't say, I'm going to encounter grace and go do what I've been doing. When she encountered grace, it empowered her to be different and to become different in her life. John says in that um, Christmas story that he has, he says, from his fullness, we have all received. And notice the phrase, grace upon grace. Say grace upon grace. What does that mean? It means that as we go through life, grace upon grace, step by step, we are encountering grace. And as we encounter grace, that grace empowers us and changes us to be utterly different. Part of the reason I'm overwhelmed is I, up here on this platform, I remember the first time I was on this platform. I was all by myself, empty. And I came in here and preached a sermon when no one was around, thinking there might be a day I really got to do that. I can remember it. I can remember the things that were in my heart, the things that were there, not good. 
I can look back and I can tell you with all certainty the man I am today is not the same man I was then and it's not because of me I will boast in the grace and the goodness of God because he has done things that I never expected or I have never seen in my life it is the journey that is called salvation great picture would be a picture of a baby get in your mind a baby See, I am really really excited by the way my first grandkid is coming to our world the end of September now I know what you're thinking you're thinking he does not look old enough to be a granddad I know I mean, we started having kids like we were 12. And so <laughs> we're having our first grandkid. Now, I want you to get a picture of a baby in your mind. You're holding a baby. Is that baby completely human? Some of you look at me like, oh, that is the dumbest question in the world. Of course it's completely human. But is it fulfilling the totality of its humanity yet? Completely human, but it still has to fulfill the totality of its humanity. I mean, we expect that child to progress and to grow and to change and to mature. There is a journey of maturity that child's going to have. We don't make fun of that kid for not maturing. We expect it. We don't look at that kid crawling around when it's one year old on all fours. We don't say, what's up, kid? We're bipedal creatures. We're not four. Uh, yeah, watch this. It's walking. It's not hard. We do this. It's not that big a deal. We don't do that. We expect a child to go from not being able to do anything to roll over, to being able to crawl, to being able to pull up, to being able to walk wobbly, to be able to walk, to be able to run, to be able to mature through all the stations of life. That's what it means to become what you already are. When we encounter the grace of God, we have become something. And the journey of our life is to become more and more what we already are in Jesus Christ. See, grace brings forgiveness. Grace empowers you to live differently. It was in this church through a former pastor that I served under that I was introduced to a preacher by the name of Dr. E.V. Hill. Dr. E.V. Hill was an African-American pastor, Mount Zion Baptist Church, inner city of Los Angeles. Passed on to be with the Lord a number of years ago, but I loved to listen to him preach. I mean, he had this raspy voice, and it wasn't because he smoked, but he sounded like a smoker, but it was because he shouted. Uh, before there were microphones and things like that. And he had that cadence of an African-American preacher. Man, see, I have no rhythm whatsoever. And so there's no chance for me to preach in a rhythmic way whatsoever. I was just amazed at him, and I would listen to him. And I remember one time specifically this story. And it's not the, the words aren't exactly the same. But I remember here, and I could see the picture in his mind. He'd been preaching on this journey, how we were changed from glory to glory by the grace of God. And then he just stood there, and everything got quiet. held up a finger he goes this is you ruined and rotten from birth destined for hell apart from God but then by the grace of God you encounter Jesus you say yes to be his follower, and Jesus does the amazing. He takes his robe of purity and righteousness, and he places it upon you. And now, when God looks down upon you, he does not see you. He sees Jesus. This is your position in Jesus. The problem, the problem is that in our day-to-day -day life, we do not live up to our position. We look, and there is the old man trained under the mastery of sin. And that old man still rears its ugly head so that we do not live up to our position in Jesus Christ. This is your condition. This is your position, but this is your condition. And the journey, the journey is God by his grace working in you day by day to make your condition more equal to your Position, this journey called salvation, the theologians call it sanctification, is to make your condition become more equal to your position. Do you want to hear some good news? I said, do you want to hear some good news? God is faithful, and he will bring to completion that which he has begun in Jesus Christ. No one, I said no one will ever be able to snatch you from the hands of your father. And one day you can bet the farm on it that your condition will be equal to your position and you will stand before the father face to face rejoicing over this thing called salvation. Somebody shout hallelujah. That is grace. 
Come on, are you amazed? An ongoing amazement at the grace of God is a sign of spiritual vitality and health. When we lose our amazement, we begin to lose so much. We lose our love. See, if you had asked me a few years ago my journey, I would have told you I was about this simple. The longer I walk with God and the more I see the reality of his grandness, his purity, and his wonders, I keep having to back up my beginning point. And the video guy said, I can't go off the carpet, but I promise you, I start way over there. <laughs> and the longer I live, the more I know how much further I was away from him. I know the depths of my depravity and the depths of sin because I see his holiness and I see his grandness. And my awe increases at what he has given us. It's amazing. Do you think the woman never gives her name? Do you think she left amazed? Do you remember where you started? Maybe you're there right now. And you're thinking, there's no chance for me. The grace of God is sufficient for any and every situation. You don't have to tell me your situation. I don't care. I know him. And I know he is enough for whatever you are. If it's not enough for you, it's not enough for me. You say yes. And his price becomes effectual and you begin a journey. And that journey is going to make you different. I tell you, not only can you change, you will change. You cannot help it. It is the nature of grace. And the more you change, the more you look back, the more amazed you become. Unless, unless we fall prey to church. I love church. I love every facet of it. But the longer we sit here, the more we can think, I've done something to earn this. I've done something to get it instead of just walking in greater amazement. Isn't it amazing when you hear the first parts of that old hymn, Amazing Grace? Something begins to stir inside of you, doesn't it? Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. Now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Come on. I challenge you right now, where are you on your journey? Are you amazed? If you're not amazed, would you ask God to amaze you again? Would you ask him to awaken? Would you go back to where you were and think, where would you be? I sat on that pew two weeks ago. I looked down and I saw my family, I know this. I would not have been faithful to my wife. We've been married 30 years this year. It's incredible. We would have never made it 30 years except for the grace of God. My kids wouldn't love Jesus. My kids wouldn't be in the place they are. I just start looking at all the things in my life that has transpired in the 35 years since Jesus showed up in my room in Pampa, Texas and drew me to himself. And I had to confess two weeks ago, God, I've lost some of my amazement. Forgive me. Overwhelm me with what you have done because I want to love you much. Maybe you're there with me and you want to say the pr same prayer. That's what you get to do today. Maybe today you're at the starting point. Somebody invited you. Somebody came. You don't even know why you're here. I have it happen all the time. And you're thinking, these, all these people, they got all their stuff together, but I don't have my stuff together. I, I, I got to get my stuff together before I can do this thing. Really, all you do is say yes. You take your stuff and you lay it at the feet of Jesus. And he covers you with his grace and you begin a journey. Would you do this with me? Would you bow your heads? Would you just begin to pray what you need to pray to God right now? Come on, this is not about me. This is about us. Would you begin to pray what you need to pray? If you need to confess that you've lost some amazement, tell him. Say, God, increase my amazement. Make me aware again. I want to love you much. I know you do. Nobody wants to fall prey. Nobody wants to be Simon. Simon didn't want to be Simon. But we can think it's about coming to church so many times and doing this and doing this. And I'm all for going to church and serving, but those things aren't what amazes us. What amazes us is Jesus. We need to encounter him.
Maybe you've never said yes to be his follower. Today's the day you want to do that. One thing I, I love, what I've heard about this church, is that almost at the end of every service we pray a prayer together. You know, we call it the sinner's prayer. It's just a way of saying, man, I need you. I, I will tell you the truth. I, I pray the sinner's prayer every time somebody leads me in it because I want grace. And so here's what I want you to do right now. If, if you need to pray, don't pray it if you don't mean it. But if you can pray with integrity, Jesus, I want you. I want you today. Maybe you said yes to him 50 years ago, 20 years ago, 5 years ago. Maybe you've never said yes to him. If you want to say yes to him today, if you want to say yes to him in a fresh way today, I just want you to pray after me. It's real simple. I just want you to say, Dear Father, I confess to you I'm a sinner without you. I thank you for Jesus and all that he did. I declare with my mouth what Jesus did is enough. And only what Jesus did is enough. I say yes to Jesus. I say yes to be his follower. I say yes to be his servant. I receive forgiveness. Continue to change me till I look like Jesus. I ask. In Jesus' name. And the people of God said, amen, amen. amen. God bless you guys.